Hi guys, first and foremost, it's a pleasure. Thank you for joining us today. We're very, very spoiled, to be honest. Uh, we've got people, we've got climate experts, we've got directors of both um, plays, and we've also got a community activist support with us today as well. So I guess the concept of today is basically just to kind of get as much from these guys as possible, share some knowledge. But at the same time, we've got an opportunity for you guys to also ask some questions as well. So I just, I guess by way of introduction, it'd be fantastic. Let's start off with you, Steve, just to kind of briefly just, for many people who might not know you or the kind of work that you've um, done, but also your, in, your relation into contingency plan would be great to kind of yeah. just tell us a bit about yourself. Thank you. Um, well, I'm Steve Waters, who wrote the contingency plan, which hopefully some of you are coming to see or have seen or will see. Um, and as you, I don't know if, it basically was something I wrote 10 years ago, actually, that was on initially in London, um, and it felt at that time it was a play about speculation. Mm -hmm. And now I returned to it 10 years later, and it felt like a play that was a sort of realist play about mm -hmm. the world which we're now in, both politically and ecologically. So I was delighted to work with Caroline and Chelsea, the two directors of the show, um, and Sheffield said that they were going to stage it, which was, a, which was wonderful because we actually, this has been on a journey, I won't bore you with the details, mm -hmm. but it's arrived at the right destination. And, um, and just to say, yeah, I've worked at Sheffield a few times, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a show on in the Crucible back in 2003 called World Music, show on here called The Unthinkable in 2004. I'll go dot, dot, dot in a minute. But one last show, <laughs> 2019, Last King of Scotland. So, uh, you know, and that's, it's such a great theatre. Um, mm -hmm. It's one of the first places I went to see proper theatre saw a Harold Barker play on that stage back in 1981. So it's an incredible honour to be here mm. doing work on these stages. So, yeah, I mean, that's the, the sort of headlines. Of yeah, and even though you kind of wrote this a long time ago, it does feel very fitting to, in terms of what's happening at the moment. Just a show of hands, like, how many of you have watched both plays? <laughs> you will do, of course. <laughs> have any of you watched it... The, the first time it was shown years and years ago. <laughs> oh, <No>. two people. <laughs> yeah. they're, they're friends. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, you've got an opportunity to watch it this time um, as well. Right, and Robert. Uh, so my name is Rob Larter. I'm, I, I've been working at the British Antarctic Survey for a very long time as a marine geophysicist, which means I go on ships, my research is on ships, I look at the seafloor uh, with various kinds of physical methods to find out things about what's beneath it and the processes that have affected it. Over the last few years, my main research has been close up to the ice sheet, looking at what we can find out from what's on the seafloor uh, about how the ocean is interacting with the ice sheet and the history of how the ice sheet has changed. And particularly, uh, what a main part of my role at the moment, I'm the, uh, the UK science lead on the Thwaites Glacier collaboration, which is a big programme uh, of research between the UK and the US. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Caroline? Hi, everyone. My name is Caroline Steinbeis. Um, I um, am associate director here at Sheffield Theatres and... Um, uh, usually work on new writing and classics and often ask myself the question how relevant is the work that we can make in theatre and um, we don't often get the choice as directors to to put ourselves fully and wholeheartedly behind the message of the plays uh -huh. that we make by nature of being freelance <laughs> you need to make ends meet and sometimes you make shows that don't feel like they speak to the to the times but um um, I mean, we're right, we're right on top of it, we're right in the middle of it, and as Steve says, we have been on a journey with these, with these plays, and it's, um, it's absolutely amazing to think that uh, we have arrived here when we started working, started rehearsing the shows, we didn't have a Prime Minister, then we have a Prime Minister, <laughs> the Queen died, and suddenly we got we one now, we do now, did we? I didn't even know check my Twitter feed but um, it is very strange times and and uh, a very rare gift to be sitting on this right now so it's exciting to be here today. Amazing thank you. Mm. Hamish? Yeah I'm uh, Hamish Pritchard I'm a colleague of Rob's so I'm a glaciologist at the British Antarctic Survey since 2003. Um, I've spent that time originally looking at satellite data and measuring how the ice sheets were changing 
I moved on to field-based stuff, so doing mostly over snow surveys with radars, driving around on skidoos a lot. And then in more recent years, I've uh, had a bit of a shift out to high mountain areas, so Himalayas and Alps, and, uh, and Scandinavia and the Arctic. So moving around, looking at uh, snow and ice. Amazing, incredible stuff. Fionn? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, really honored to be here. My name's Fionn Mitchell. I'm a volunteer and community engagement manager um, for North Wales at the Marine Conservation Society. Really on, really early on in my career. Um, been working for less than two years in marine conservation. So it's really, really great to be here with you guys today. Um, do lots of work with, with young people through the Office of Future Generations Commissioner for Wales as well. Incredible, thank you. Chelsea? Hi, I'm Chelsea Walker and I directed it on the beach, which is literally just finished. Um, and yeah, I think what's kind of extraordinary about these plays is that we often find it really hard, I think, to, to find a way into the climate crisis and certainly uh, a, a kind of narrative to guide us into it. And I think what Steve's done with these two plays is created two very different but very accessible ways in for us to sort of guide us in on an emotional journey with it to something which often to me anyway feels like an enormous subject that's quite hard to comprehend. Incredible. Very briefly, my name is Majid, as former Lord Mayor of Sheffield. I currently director of a European organisation called Union of Justice, where we look at the intersection between climate and race across Europe. An interesting fact as well, I studied marine biology at university, <laughs> not that. <laughs> <laughs> but don't feel any questions on marine biology. <laughs> uh, we've, got, we've got real experts um, in, in the room, but honestly, it's a real pleasure. I've just got first question I'd love to speak, just ask Caroline and Chelsea as directors of both plays, like what kind of initially, I guess, attracted you to this to this specific project? Was it because it was timely or I guess, yeah, just what, like, what attracted to you? Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose to sort of piggyback off what Steve was saying, when they were first written, they were, um, I suppose there was, an, there was an element about them that was speculative. Mm -hmm. um, and what's been kind of amazing in the last few years, as Will says in the play, that the, so the science is changing so fast, mm -hmm. um, our government is changing so fast, that we, you know, as you're working on them, <coughs> They're being updated. I mean, Steve's probably on draft 300 now. Um, it's kind of amazing. We've been, been so brilliant at updating them. But to work on something that is that, is that fresh is, is, is really exciting and, and feels like, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't come around all that often. Mm, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, absolutely echo that. And, and you know, you read, you read new plays, and, and I, could, I think it's fair to say still, Steve, that it's a... It's a new play very yeah, much, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. we're within the last 12 years. Um, but uh, but you, you very rarely come across a play that has dialogue like this, that has muscle and energy and argument and intelligence. And um, it's, it's a very rare thing to find a, a contemporary piece of work that sits with the Ibsens and with the Millers and... You know, though, and sorry, Steve, I don't want to, <laughs> you know, embarrass you. Um, but uh, but these plays feel like that. I mean, we reference we reference Arthur Miller all the time, and I, I mean, you've I think particularly I think in, in on the beach you talk about Arthur, you talked about Arthur Miller a lot, um, and uh, and so yeah, they really are a gift and and. And, and particularly challenging because you can read them and read them and prepare and prepare and by God, I mean, we've been on these for a while now and still you hear something new every night and, and a new thought emerges every night and the actors are still, you know, f formulating and figuring out what this, what this beast really is and the fact that these two pieces can speak to each other like that and we can now see, see them in one today, which is such a fantastic thing. And to hear the echoes of one into the other is a very rare, uh, beautiful thing. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, it was a no-brainer, really. Mm. Steve, do you know when you first wrote this, it was, I guess it was at a time where people were still, a lot of things were up for debate, like, is the climate crisis a real thing? Mm. Is it a man-made thing? Is, mm. it, mm. is it nature? So, so, like, it's, from the time that you wrote it, I know it was a very different time, but, like, yeah. compared to now, like, in terms of the theatre perspective, like, are you seeing much difference in terms of the responses from people? Yeah, I think it's 
So true. It seems extraordinary to to think about the acceleration of change. You, you talked about when I started talking to theatres about this idea in two thousand and six. Uh, there was a genuine sense from really intelligent liberal people that, but hang on, is this actually happening? And how do you dramatise something that's so uncertain, something that we've been talking about quite a lot? Um, they weren't averse, but they didn't think there was a story in it. They didn't think it was concrete enough. Or you know, I think because theatre is a very concrete form. It's not. It's not like you know science fiction or something like that. There's a way in which you have to believe moment by moment in the action, why the characters are doing what they're doing, and this seemed to be in a space that I think a lot of theatres couldn't get their heads around. Um, and I, I think one of the reasons the plays, the A or two plays, is I also was in two minds, I suppose, about how to handle this. You know, I felt that on the one hand, I was incensed by the political failure, and I'm afraid that hasn't got any better. And in fact, it's got far worse. So, you know, there you have Resilience, which is a play which is a sort of full-on deep dive into what it might feel like to be a scientist trying to speak to the grown-ups in the room and finding that you're in the presence of people that have no real interest in the reality of the situation. But I also wanted to think about <coughs> this emotional impact, because I think the really difficult thing about climate change is it's often presented through data and numbers and you know um, incremental facts, uh, things that don't really get to our heart, it seems to me. And yet, when we really think about what this is about, it's about loss. It's about change. I've, I'm a very, very stubborn, unchanging kind of person. I spend most of my energy trying not to change. Uh, and yet, what climate change is asking us to do is change incredibly quickly. And, and loss, you know, I think one of the reasons that On the Beach is so located on this very, very fragile landscape of North Norfolk, and there are many other landscapes like this in the UK, of course, is that that is facing extinction. And if that's happening in the United Kingdom, clearly, by extension, the rest of the world is facing far graver uh, levels of loss. And to just, uh, in a way, I think Chelsea and Caroline put their finger on it, just allow a type of work which we can actually think those thoughts without being so hammered down into the ground and, and just sort of depressed by it. That's, that's the task, it seems to me, that it should also be fun. <laughs> yeah, there should be humour, there should be character. Uh, so that's kind of explains this big mammoth of a piece that ended up, you know, breaking out the boundaries of an individual play. Mm -hmm. And that was my way, I think, of arguing to the theatre people, look, you know, look, we can make this as, as moving as a play about, you know, whatever else seems to be relevant in 2008. Um, and and it's, so it seemed to prove back in 2009. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's thrilling to go back to it, because actually it was ripped out of me very fast. Uh, you know, I was writing you know, in a, in a sort of state of almost a, a, a blur. And, and it's a bit like going back to sort of errors you made in your past and having an opportunity to put a few things right. Uh, so it's been a real joy to go back and fix a few things and sort a few plot things out and then, yeah, allow this new reality into the play. But that doesn't mean it's not a chilling thing as well because there are things here that are just like, gosh, this has happened in my lifetime. Mm. And, and quite a small fraction of my lifetime some of these things have happened. So, yeah, it's been, it's been a journey. Amazing. Rob, you've worked at the British Antarctic Survey a really long time, and when you kind of mentioned it in your introduction. So you literally would have been ahead in terms of, like, understanding the climate science and realising that we had this big problem that we were kind of facing. And in some ways, it kind of feels as if, like, the rest of the world and other sectors have kind of been trying to play catch-up in some degree. So what would you say is why... Has it taken a long time from knowing and understanding the science and knowing that this was an impeding problem? Why has it taken, in your opinion, for people to kind of catch up, to take this seriously? I think over the, the time period that Steve was talking about, since 2006, and that resonates with me because that's about when I really started focusing on West Antarctica. Mm. And the reason we started focusing there is because about 25 years ago in the late 90s, that's the first time we, we knew there was real change going on there. There were satellite images that... The, the first satellite images showing change in ice surface elevation that really showed significant change, significant ice loss in West Antarctica. And even then, even through to like 2006, we knew that that ice loss was happening, but we couldn't for certain link it to global climate change. Yeah. And, and in fact, e e I think the significant work <laughs> has come out even in the last five years that, that strengthens that link now. And we now better understand how it is linked to global climate change because 
In most of Antarctica, you don't get a lot of surface melting. It's not like Greenland, where you've probably seen images like you might have seen on Frozen Planet 2, where huge amounts of surface melting, rivers and, and moulands on the surface of the ice sheet. You don't have that in Antarctica. The, the summer air temperatures don't get that hot. What we do have is, is warm water coming from, from the deep ocean. That's, that's, and that's, that's the mechanism. We, we, that was worked out, again, 25 years ago, that it was the warm water coming from the deep ocean that's doing the damage. But how that was linked to climate change is, I think that the, the real links have only been shown in, in about the last five years. Mm. And so, yeah, we've definitely gone from the speculation mm. to this is scary. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. Hamish, um, Hamish, sorry, I keep mispronouncing <laughs> Hamish. I guess in the climate sciences, it's, you often work with a lot of complex information, complex data. How do you take complex information like that and try and communicate that with ordinary people who aren't scientists? Like, what do you think scientists are doing well or, or aren't doing well in terms of communicating that to people? Yeah, so, uh, well, one of the big challenges we have as scientists is that most of the time we're focused, I was just talking about this before, we're focused in on a very specific thing. Mm. So I've been focusing in on an instrument to measure snowfall and I'm you know, building bits of wire and that kind of thing. Or I'm focusing in on how to process satellite data and there are very specific technical problems. Mm. And so we have a very narrow focus of a bit of science. And I, I think that we, we came up with it just as we were talking as a way of kind of, that's how the question there at the time was how do you, how do you not get personally affected, emotionally affected by the change that, is, that Steve showed so well? And I think that is the answer. That we're so focused on a very specific thing and we've got a very specific task. Like when Rob's on a, a cruise, he'll be very specifically focused on getting his instruments working and his data collected and then out again. Um, and so a lot of the time we don't take, we don't step back and take a big picture view, which is what is needed really to translate into, uh, into uh, a message which can be absorbed by uh, the, the population in general. Mm -hmm. What I have been involved in in recent years is, is big, an author on one of the big IPCC reports. And they really, what was a bit of an eye opener with those, there's all the science, you know, all the digesting of the science and summarizing and reviewing it and then trying to really come out with specific messages which uh, can be can be stood up and uh, supported. And then there's a whole other effort by another team which is to make those into executive summaries and <laughs> summaries of policymakers and really try to really try to get that message in the simplest possible way. Even then they still still reads quite it's quite complicated. Uh, but I think maybe what Steve is doing is with this play. I mean it, for example, if you have the the largest foreseeable sea level rise if you have a, if you go right out to the extreme end of the predictions mm. uh, by 2100 you could potentially get two meters of sea level rise and that so by that, that if you think of that two meters <coughs> and you think of that time frame about 80 years less than 80 years that's about one human lifespan two meters is about the height of a tall person mm. so if you imagine a small child going down to the beach today and paddling on the beach uh, and then if they, as they grow up, they go back maybe in middle age and the waters, they go to exactly the same place and the water's up to here. And then if they went back in the old age, it's now above their heads. Uh, you can kind of do that kind of thing where you, you put it into a human, an individual human perspective. And I don't want to alarm people because that, that two meters is right out of the extreme limit of what's possible. Uh, but if it, it's possible to make those kind of um, analogies to... Uh, to an individual which can resonate, which is exactly what, of course, is, is the, the, the play is about. Of course, yeah. no, thank you. But enough to cause big problems anyway. Yeah. But uh, Fionn, I guess someone like, I know a lot of the work you do is in Wales, you work with a lot of communities. How do you think all that kind of translates in terms of working with communities, mainly, mainly those in the like, forefront of the climate crisis, or how do you think communities, in, in your specific case in Wales, are engaging with the climate crisis, do you kind of feel as if like more people are more aware due to like arts and culture or through school? I know it's not part of, they may kind of touch upon it in geography and stuff, but it's, mm -hmm. are you kind of feeling a sense of more people are actually aware, but also not just aware, but actually being active about it? Yeah, definitely. I think communities across the UK are in <clears throat> a really different position of of power in terms of knowledge and awareness than we were you know 30 40 years ago you know and that is very much in thanks to to all the work that you guys have been doing you know not just in the sense of collecting that physical 
data, but then also communicating that like Steve is doing today. And I think we're seeing more opportunities for people to engage with that. Because as you were saying earlier, you know, this is a really, really massive, complex problem. And it's very, very easy for people to feel really helpless in the face of that and really powerless in the face of that. So a lot of the work that, that I do in Wales is about giving back that power and enabling mm. that power. So really helping communities and individuals, no matter your background, recognise the opportunities available to you to make a difference. So a lot of the work that I do, for example, is based around citizen science, um, which is is all about training people up in some really kind of simplistic methodology so that they can go out to their local beach, their local environment, and they can collect really valuable data, which the Marine Conservation Society can then take to Welsh Government, the SENEV, or to UK Government as well, and really say, hey, you know, your, the people of your country have collected this evidence to show you how bad the, the problem is on their doorstep. And that really instills a sense of power in people, making them feel like they can do something that is tangibly making a difference. So I think it's about, just, you know, taking it one step at a time, making it, yes, real, but also not overwhelmingly real, mm. that people still have time to, to do something and their contribution does make a difference no matter how small. Amazing. Steve, Caroline and Chelsea, I guess as theatre makers, as creative practitioners, like what, what, what would you say the role of the arts, so specifically theatre, has in terms of, as well as kind of sp spreading awareness of certain causes and issues, but more importantly, how do you get, like, in terms of, do you think it does a good job in getting people to kind of act? Or what role does it have in terms of social impact, shall we say? But also, I guess, in terms of the contingency plan or just any kind of social cause, do you think it's... Do you think more so like sending a hopeful message in art play is more effective than sending one of like doom and gloom? I know they've both got their own kind of important roles to play, especially in the climate crisis, because yeah, we need to be realistic and tell people in terms of like the reality of what it is, but at the same time, it's a lot of kind of research we say in terms of getting people to artists trying to share a different alternative, positive future of what things can be. Like, I guess when you were writing this, Steve, like did those kind of things cross your mind? Yeah, I think they do. And I, I think a little bit about our colleagues in the sciences, you know, who, who, who <coughs> might quite frequently think about impact, but they also have to remain true to their vocation. They have mm. to be good scientists first and foremost. And I think we have to be good artists first and foremost, because there's, uh, you know, I think the, the, the desire to reverse engineer art to make sure it gets an impact means that audiences are like, whoa, yeah, <laughs> I know what you're trying to do. Uh, and I feel like my role is to, and my role, I mean, I write in a very sort of immediate and intuitive way, actually. Mm. Uh, and, and I think what, you know, your point, Majid, about hope is a really interesting one, because I think that we all want hope, but we don't want false hope. Mm. And, and, I, and I feel like theatre is one place where you can tell the truth. Uh, it's a different truth from what you might get in a scientific paper. Uh, and what you might get in a newspaper. It's much more all-encompassing. And I think so climate change, as we keep saying, is so complex. You can't have a single position on it. You know, you can't just come out of it feeling depressed or elated. You're going to feel all the feelings that you feel about all the really important things in life, you know, mortality or, or any of those things. So, you know, there's definitely other types of work I've done which are a little bit more on the nose and a little bit more deliberate in, you know, let's try and make and take people into the natural environment or, you know, let's try and nail this particular question. But I think these plays, the way that they are as they are is that they're, they are capacious, you know, they're trying to be as big as the question that we're facing. And I think that helps the audience not feel like they're being preached at because I don't think I know what I think. Uh, I mean, I know what I think about what I'm doing in my writing, but in terms of what this leaves the audience with, I think it leaves them with as much complexity as the issue requires. Mm -hmm. um, and it's over to people like Fionn to, to find really pragmatic and immediate ways of dealing with these questions. And I think that's a slightly different task from what we're about. But it can provoke these kind of conversations, apart yeah. from anything else, you know. And, yeah. You know, what I love about theatre is people tend to talk after the show. Yeah. Um, and uh, you don't tend to talk when you're looking at your phone on a train or, you know, it just is different. There's nothing wrong with that. But theatre, you know, enables this kind of thing to happen. And I think that's, you know, that's why it's so important. Yeah. I think on your topic of hope, it's, a lot of times hope in itself can be very spectatorial kind mm. of thing. That's why, like, 
I guess, hope without an actual just some sort of wish, as people might kind of put it. But like you said, I guess people will kind of just interpret it how they want to interpret it. And I guess that in itself is a good thing, basically. I guess coming to like Caroline and Chelsea, like I guess when you were directing the plays, both different plays, but it's, what was your intent? Like what, I guess, what is your hope for when people watch it? And then you kind of like think about in terms of I want, this is a takeaway that I would want mm. and the audience to take away. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, staging resilience is is a huge challenge technically, first mm. and foremost, because the rhythm that Steve writes really sort of needs to be adhered to for the story to sing, and and so there's there's that element of the work which is literally just getting the thing on its feet so that you can so that you can look at what it's looking to affect and i mean we had a long conversation about what do we think you wanted to say because because actually what i was hoping we would be able to say with these plays is there is a hope and there is a new way for us to move. And what I discovered <laughs> is that resilience is about resilience and it is about learning with what is already there. And in a way, actually, activating your imagination to be able to think differently about what's coming. And I mean, really, you know, I could I could sit and regurgitate lines from the piece now, but it, it is very much about not trying to, to 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 move yourself into a state of 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 shock and freeze at the prospect of of what of what is is building around us, but actually to be able to move yourself past that. And I think even though the play, and I hope some of you will see the play this evening, um doesn't necessarily leave you with a happy end. Mm -hmm. It certainly should provoke a front-footedness in how you understand the limitations of government. And, the <coughs> and we are very much seeing that and have been very much lived that, you know, in the, not just in the past 48, 45 days. <laughs> um, uh, but, but, but really that actually your own accountability starts, starts mattering more and more. And um, and that it is about that it is about recognizing that as human beings we are fallible and seduced into power and seduced into believing we can make change and then recognizing that actually perhaps perhaps we put our trust too much in in in, in the powers that be and and actually yeah the individual starts becoming more and more important and I think. I think that's if if you know if resilience is able to communicate that and is in is able to communicate that that vanity and and um, and power do do mean that people don't necessarily always keep the best of the nation at mind <laughs> but are are propelled by their own uh by their own uh, ambitions uh then I think we've done something right <laughs> this evening. Chelsea, like, what was it like, I guess, because you're, you're both working with the same cast, basically. What was it like, I guess, from a director's perspective, working closely, that closely with another director? And I guess it's a, a, a two-part kind of play that is so linked. Kind of, is that process, because like, many directors just do single-off shows, but what was that experience like? Um, it's amazing. Um, it's, directing can be quite a lonely job. Um, you have a very close relationship with your cast, you have a very close relationship with your creative team, but you are also the person who is driving and pushing and um, and sort of has your eye on the, on the whole thing. So to have someone to do that with mm. is incredibly bolstering. Um, I highly recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think it's also... <laughs> I think allows you to have some perspective on the plays. It's very difficult uh, getting to a point in rehearsals and going, okay, now we pause that for three days while you rehearse the other play when you're in a momentum. But it also allows you to step away and see, okay, what have we created? Where are we at? How is that speaking mm -hmm. to the other play? Um, 
of course the actors didn't get to do that mm. and that's really hard it's a very intense process for mm. them they're an extraordinary cast um because they're they're staging two enormous epic emotionally intense plays um in a very short amount of time so mm. they've done yeah. an incredible job and they don't get that break mm. but for us we get a little bit of time to to look at it afresh amazing I think the word intense is definitely <laughs> a real thing. Do you know, it's not every day we really get to meet, like, Antarctic climate scientists kind of thing. So I'm sure there's many people in the audience as well that are very curious in terms of, like, what can you, like, tell us some secrets? Like, <laughs> uh, have you found things that nobody knows yet? Or, like, any interesting facts of life as Antarctic kinds of would be greatly appreciated. Oh, insights. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think you see every expedition, every research cruise, in my case, I've gone on, you see new things. And I, I saw a great phrase that somebody in my line of work, not somebody I've never worked with, put out on social media once that they were going off to see, uh, to see things that people had never seen before and would never see again. Mm -hmm. Because what you're going to see is changing in front of you. Mm -hmm. So if you come back the next year, it's not the same. So when you're there, you're seeing something that's in that moment and then mm. it's gone. Wow. Yeah, I think we think times have changed perhaps since the the, ca the characters in, well, certainly Robin, the older character in, in Steve's play. Um, there's much more immediacy to science, I think, uh, now, especially there's a lot more focus. Uh, there's a lot, there are lots more mechanisms for transmitting those messages mm. <laughs> with mass media, I suppose, really, I'm thinking. Uh, there's perhaps more attention than in the past to what we're saying. So that's, things get, stories get picked up more. Uh, there's an interest in that. So I don't think there are, as far, not, I don't know already <laughs> some big secret bits of science about to emerge. Uh, I, remember, I do remember though, when I was starting, when I was a PhD student, I, start, I was just starting at, at uh, British Antarctic Survey, so about 20 years ago. Uh, the, what was new then, well, what had just happened were the big ice, big Larsen B ice shelf collapse in West Antarctica, on the Antarctic Peninsula. And at the same time, these glaciers were doing all sorts of crazy retreating and crumbling and falling apart over coastal Greenland. And when you go to a conference, there's like, what's all these incredible surprises that really hadn't, genuinely hadn't been seen before uh, around that time. And that it was an incredibly exciting time because suddenly, because we had the term that glacial change is meant to be extremely slow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it was a phrase. Uh, and yet we were seeing things where huge glaciers were, were falling apart in a summer. And that had never been seen before on, on any scale. And so I think at that time, then that was a real moment of revelation, those few years around the turn of the millennium. Um, and... Yeah, that when things started to really happen fast. And I think the real eye-opener was that the, the, those systems do, they have these tipping points that can go quickly uh, and on, you know, really within a few months. I mean, we're used to seeing things which are very difficult, or not seeing things, but we're used to, used to hearing about change, which is almost indiscernible to people because they're so slow. And uh, it might take decades, and you think, well, is it any warmer this year than it was 20 years ago? It's hard to tell. Uh, because it was sort of imperceptible change. But then we suddenly started to see these radical changes. Uh, and of course, the whole idea of tipping points in these systems is now well established. As a tip, uh, the, whole, the whole reason why West Antarctica is, is a, a threat for sea level rise is because of a tipping point to do with it buoy its buoyancy, and uh, it starts to collapse and it'll accelerate in its collapse. Uh, similarly with Greenland, it's got a tipping point which is to do with its height, and as it, as it lowers due to melting, then it lowers into a warmer and warmer environment. And so then it can't regenerate because it doesn't get enough snow. And that's a slower tipping point. But there are these tipping points all, all through this system. So there's Arctic sea ice. You lose Arctic sea ice and you have a black ocean, which absorbs more sunlight. And so, you have, well, that's a, that's a, a feedback which is running away. Uh, permafrost, you start to melt the permafrost and you release more uh, uh, um, to methane and CO2 and uh, of course that drives more warming so I think that's been a realisation <clears throat> is the, the potential the speed of change is that um, the understanding of that potential for rapid change is, is a big thing 
uh, whether there were more of these surprises out there about to hit us, there could be. Yeah, mm. it could be. Mm. And you guys work with other bodies around the world in terms of, I know it's like the British and um, talked to server you work for, but how much information is actually shared with, I'm sure you work with kind of like the IPCC, it's a global organisation, but you kind of feel as if like it is a global effort. Well, I guess it has to be a global effort, but how much do you actually collaborate with other and groups and bodies around the world? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the, 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 what I said at the start, so a big focus of my work at the moment is this big US-UK collaboration looking at what's going on with Thwaites Glacier, the most vulnerable and most rapidly changing large glacier in Antarctica. And so that, that's huge. Um, the, the, uh, the amount of funding going into that is, is about $50 million in total. Not uh, enough. So eight different research pro projects uh, all with multiple researchers, groups of students looking at different aspects of the system, some of them modelling it, some of them like me looking on the marine side of things, some of them working on the ice, some of them using airborne data, some of them looking at the margin of the glacier, some of them looking at the base of the glacier, things like this, using all sorts of different techniques. And so this is a huge collaboration involving a lot of scientists in the, in the United States, a lot of scientists in, in uh, the UK, also drawing in people from Germany, Sweden, Korea, so and and yeah, that's one of the joys of, of of doing this kind of research is is the the opportunity to work with so many different people from different cultures and and that really helps the science I think that people bring different perspectives. Mm. But I do want to follow up that you know Hamish talks about all these tipping points and you quickly can go from there to mm -hmm. people saying oh we're doomed we're doomed and you know you publish your results sometimes and you see it picked <laughs> up in various fora and people using that to say, it doesn't matter what we do, we're doomed. And, and that's the last place we want to go. Uh, I, I think it's, I would say the news on climate is a bit like the news on the economy at the moment. Hmm. It's, it's, it, it's not good. We're in a bad state, but it's quite easy, as I think we've all seen in the, in the last few weeks, to make it a lot worse. <laughs> <laughs> so what we do does matter. Mm, definitely. Thank yeah. you. I guess a um, question for Fionn is, Caroline kind of made the interesting point earlier on that you can't have too much faith in the powers that be like governments and stuff. And it's when you kind of realise, or when you kind of just see other people taking arms up themselves, taking like non-violent direction, direct action, like you've got your Just Oil and Extinction Rebellion. Do you kind of like, how is that impacting like communities? Do you kind of think that is bringing people on side or like what, in general? Because a lot of people do kind of are really frustrated in the sense that like all these gas and oil companies that like governments are in their pocket. It's just not working out and it's people have got no faith or trust that governments can do things. So a lot of the time it's left for ordinary people to do, mm. to try and do something. So then you get certain groups that do, like, of course, take non-violent direct action. Like, you just, you know, like, do you kind of feel like what is when you kind of speak people within the community, the people within your work, what kind of impact is that having? Well, I think working with people and working between communities is a really complex thing. Mm. Not everyone will share the same views. Not everyone will have the, the same situations, the same lived experiences as other people. Mm. Everyone is, is passionate and aware about different things. So you may have some people that are you know, they can't, they can't see any other course of action than to join <laughs> Extinction Rebellion and block as many roads as they can, you know? And then alternatively, you'll have the people that are really passionate about the environment and get really frustrated with people that take that line of activism mm. because they don't believe that it's particularly serving for, for the cause. <coughs> because then what, what you might get is a lot of people perceiving environmentalists in a, in a very negative way harmful light and of course that's not what we need when actually what we need to be doing is is promoting that environmental movement and say look it's not it's not a hippie thing it's genuinely a survival thing at this point mm -hmm. and people i think it's about really transcending that that stereotype of how we perceive someone passionate about the environment to be mm -hmm. you know and i feel like in my work so far there have definitely been some some kind of key shifts in in attitudes or at least key differences in attitudes between particular generations as well. And I think that that is in part down to this sense of helplessness, this sense of, of maybe complacency. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, a lot of people that I work with, a lot of people that, that live in kind of the communities that I serve are 
understandably really angry, really mm. frightened. You know, they're filled with a lot of, of climate anxiety, which is definitely a real thing that, that people struggle with these days. Mm. And it's a lot to come into, mm. right? Like I've, I've been working in marine conservation for, for less than two years. I'm terrified. You know, I've, I've come into this, into this sector, into this career thinking, oh God, can I actually do anything meaningful at this point? So it's mm -hmm. not, it's something that we all, that we all grapple with constantly. You know, it constantly takes work. Um, and I think that we're, we're really similar in that light. You know, the people that, that, that work at the front line from the career point of view and, and the people that are in these communities, you know, having those lived experiences of you know seeing their their front gardens flooded from storm surges, for instance, mm. and I think it's it's just a it's a really really complex thing. I definitely think that people are more aware and more willing to take action, and that action completely varies again between people. You will have some people that are very comfortable and confident in doing that front that front of line quite grating, shocking level of activism. Mm. You know, like we had. A couple of activists climb um, the bridge recently, which was terrifying. I certainly would never have the guts to do something like that. But then you also have that the types of activism like writing to your MP, you know, mm -hmm. attending your, your local parish council meetings and feeling back that you're concerned. That's activism as well. Mm -hmm. So I think it's about really reframing how we look at activism, how we look at involvement and engagement and how people can really help support their local environment, not just for themselves, but then also for future generations to come. Definitely. And I think the thing is, it's sometimes you can kind of feel as if like it's something that's happened very far away, like we hear through the news, like the floods in Pakistan, like the droughts in Somalia. Of course, we know the people in majority, what do you call it? Um, global South are the ones that mm -hmm. are mostly impacted by it. But then it's like, how do you get people in the UK, in our communities to care? Well, because how do you get them, how do you get them to have empathy to what's happening? for those that are basically being impacted. But then again, it's like, even in Sheffield alone, like air pollution contributes to 500 early deaths. Like even to the point where the first school to ever to be closed down due to the air pollution being that bad was a school in Sheffield in Tinsley. So we don't have to really look to like a country in the globe. We have to be like, yeah. no, it's actually, it's really, we need to do something about it kind of thing. But I guess in terms <coughs> of like people in the audience, what, if you kind of like, I guess in your experience, what would you say, I know you said, Activism comes in many different forms. We've all got our own degree of influence, but if there was like one or two takeaways, you think that we can, I guess, audience, or we can basically just do to try and push forward, what would you say? I would say start small. Mm. Do things that are within your means to do that you would feel comfortable doing, mm. you know, and that could be as simple as reducing your plastic use, which, yeah, I know some people may roll their eyes, oh, <laughs> we've heard that enough, but genuinely it's still a real issue. There's a reason why people keep talking about it, you know? So thinking about what can you, what can you reuse? Can you avoid kind of that item that's mm. covered in plastic with something that's loose? You know, can you, can you use a reusable bottle, you know, in, mm. instead of kind of plastic that you don't need? So I think just start small, look around your home and really think, what, what can I change here? What would I be okay with changing? And then that will give you the momentum to keep going then. Then you'll be thinking, okay, what can I change next? Like, what can I do next? And then also lean on the people around you, lean on the organizations around you that can help you. I mean, the third sector, it's our, it's our bread and butter to try and do this kind of stuff. And by stuff, I mean, enabling communities and people to take action. And, you know, and third sectors do great stuff these days. I mean, I know that some, some organizations operating in Wales will provide free transport to beaches so that people can build up that connection, that relationship with the ocean, for instance, to motivate them to make positive behavior change at home. I mean, that's great, free day at the beach. <laughs> no, who doesn't want that? So there, there are definitely lots of great options these days for free that third sector organizations can, you know, they are there to serve you and to help you make that change. So reach out, you know, reach out to us. Amazing, thank you. We'll throw it out to the audience and has anybody got any question that they'd like to ask our wonderful panelist? <laughs> Linda Duckinfield, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, I'd, I'd like to, to ask generally, uh, to picking up from the idea of activism, how we actively oppose the energy lobbies. And, and 
maybe you'd like to comment on how the energy lobbies have subverted and suppressed some of the scientific information over the last decades. Um, and maybe you'd like to comment on how we could be creative in doing that. I'm part of Extinction Rebellion as it happens. Um, we need more creative ideas, so I'll just throw that out. Brilliant. So Linda asks how, I guess we can, I guess, put up a fight against those kind of climate, like energy lobbyists in terms of like... When it, to all of you. To all of you, yeah. I suppose one, one big and very important step is actually to demystify how they are how they are blocking information from going where it needs to go in the first place so that people understand what the issue is to begin with because actually many people don't understand how these machines work and as soon as you can identify where the cogs sit I think doors start opening but demystifying what that process actually is is probably the first thing you know educating <laughs> educating people the, I mean, I, yeah, I, I think first a shout out to Extinction Rebellion. I think your work is extraordinary. And I don't think we'd be talking about climate emergency. You know, and it's a classic example. You're absolutely right, Beyond, that, you know, there are many ways of being active and alert about this. <coughs> but we get very used very quickly to the sort of uh, provocation that something like Extinction Rebellion achieved in 2019. Um, and, you know, we, we shouldn't. Um, in terms of the oil uh, and fossil fuel <laughs> sector, I think it's a really good point because it sort of feels like it's a little bit treated as if, the, oh, that's a bit obvious, you know? You know, if we were to write about that, wouldn't that just be a little bit tub thumping and, you know, but actually, increasingly, what's so scary about these times is that's so clear uh, as never before. And I think making embedded fossil fuels and uh, the people that purvey them, as well as people that consume them, which is obviously, you know, us, visible in a different way is really important and I would recommend there's a wonderful book came out recently called Crude Britannia by former energy correspondent in the Guardian Terry McAllister and, and, a, and a really good uh, artist actually theatre artist James Marriott and it's, it's terribly interesting it's all about the history of kind of Britain and oil but one of the most revelatory things in it is page it has maps of all the networks refineries pipelines estuaries and suddenly you just see a whole landscape differently, this whole infrastructure of oil. Um, and, and I think a lot of recent research, uh, Fossil Capitalism, another great book by Andreas Mogg, is starting to tell the story of fossil fuels and how they became apparently so essential in every element of our lives. Because they are. And I think that's the really, you know, we have to acknowledge how addicted we are to them. Um, but that has been done very consciously. So, you know, finding the way to tell that story without creating, you know, kind of obvious villains, mm. because they haven't done it, obviously. <laughs> you know, so you kind of need to work out how they've done it non-obviously and how good people have done it as well as bad people. And I think that's um, probably for another dramatist other than me, but I definitely think that, you know, you're right to put <coughs> more attention to that. I, I might just add, I, there's one thing I'm hopeful about is that it's far too slow but I think they're starting to lose mm. you know they're, it's starting to shift so for about 40 percent of our electricity is now renewables and that's incredible to think you know 20 years ago 30 years ago that wouldn't have happened mm. and we're almost off coal I mean, that's all you know, incredible we've got this net zero target how you know if we're going to stick to it but uh, at least with this, the, the fact that the government has this in law a net zero target is incredible um, the fact that renewables are cheaper than fossil fuels now, and so the economics are, well, in a lot of places they're cheaper, so the economics is pushing that way. I think they're starting to lose, and I think they know it, and uh, it's too slow. I mean, that's so our job, here, well, not, I shouldn't say our job, I should say <laughs> the job of people who are campaigning, which you may or may not do, but um, is to accelerate that. No, uh, uh, and that's a lot about public opinion. Uh, it, it's absolutely true what Hamish says. A lot of people who work for big oil and gas companies do know that, that the game is up. Mm -hmm. A lot of them do understand because a lot of them are good scientists, actually. A lot of people who work for these organisations. If you look at surveys of professionals who work in the oil and gas industry, most of them accept the fact that climate change is real, that we're causing it. Um, a lot of them understand that they can't compete on price anymore now. 
and there is a growing number of people working among big oil and gas companies really engaged with the energy transition. That's not to say everybody is. That's not to say there isn't some really strong influence uh, of people who, who are still trying to spread dis disinformation. But don't think of these big companies as being amorphous and all everybody who works for them thinking the same, because there are some very skilled people who work for those companies who could be, who could be vital in the energy transition. Thank you. I mean, somebody's mentioned capitalism and <laughs> the world public. I mean, this is the absolute key to this, isn't it? It's who's got the vested interest in it. And you're saying that obviously there are good scientists within, with, or, or good workers within, <coughs> civil service within local councils. But if they are hamstrung by an economic system that favours private interests, I mean, you mentioned clean air, but I mean, you know, we're all trying to get around in cars. You know, you need good public transport, you need good, um, you know, you need public ownership of energy. I mean, yes, renewables are cheaper, but at the minute, I mean, I have a company called Good Energy, but I, at the minute I'm lucky enough to be in a fixed tariff, but they sure. pool, the cartels pool all that, um, you know, the gas, the oil and gas, pool all that, and then it's the highest price because it's the monopoly that sort of dictates mm. what the price is. So it's a big thing about public, uh, public ownership and, you know, proper democracy. And then, you know, scientists can work properly for the national interest, not the national interest of the tourists. The national interest is a genuine public interest. And I think the penny will have dropped for a lot of people with the current fuel crisis, mm. which is, of course, a, fu a fuel crisis caused by uh, fossil fuel mm. shortages. And, you know, if, if we'd invested more in our transition to renewables earlier, we wouldn't have the energy and security we've got now. Mm. Yeah. Like, uh, in a similar way to, I was talking about those big collapses and things in glaciers being a, a catalyst for change in the science. I think the big events in society are catalysts for change as well. Mm. So like the, the conflict in Ukraine is a catalyst. I mm. think events like Steve portrays with the flooded, coastal flooding will be a big catalyst for change, for understanding, for much larger scale understanding of the risk in the, on the coast. And I think the economy actually has quite a, a, a big role to play in that. So for example, with, in that scenario, uh, I think the way this will play out is that they'll start to get those, because of course we've got this gradually or steadily rising sea level, superimposed on top of it are the storm surges. And the storm surges, the effect that has is to radically change the insurability of coastal properties. And so if you go from a one in a hundred year storm surge, to fl the floods only once a century, to suddenly doing that every year, which is what we're predicted, which is predicted for the middle of this century for a lot of low lying coastal zones around the world, where about 10% of the population live. Uh, once you go from that once a century flood to anything approaching once a year, it becomes uninsurable. It's just the value is gone. And so suddenly, even if you're an arch climate skeptic and you've got an oil refinery by the coast, your oil refinery is worthless because it's uninsurable. Mm -hmm. Or if you live by your, you can't get a mortgage if you can't, if you can't insure your property. So I think the financial markets will kick in and will force change, uh, even if there are people dragging their feet, they won't be able to resist mm -hmm. that. Uh, so that is another thing that's hopeful that change will be forced upon people who will not change themselves. It's interesting that you mentioned the market, though, because it is, I mean, again, you said it, <laughs> but um, but it, 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 the market is, is, is really the most powerful thing mm. and is the one tool that, that, is, that, that accesses the mainstream. You know, we're in, we're in, we're in a very, we're in very, a very educated company here and it's, and it's accessing, it's accessing everybody and then also not forgetting that we are the people that drive markets mm. right it's all about demand mm. so it's again really trying to think about okay well how you know we're talking about really massive global markets here just thinking about how actually we have we have power within that i definitely. mean we're the consumers at the end of the day right definitely we've got five minutes left mm. and the person in front of me that Often this day and then and us and the good and the bad and it seems, I'm sure we all know that's not how the world is. You know, the two evils are capital. Venture capitalists, 
driven us to the point where renewables are cheaper. That's how it's come about, with venture capital and government subsidies. So it's great that those two things have come together and achieved what we have. I'd love to ask the scientists what they thought of the characters. Actually, the scientists sit on loops in the place. <laughs> got the, the, the Colin and Robin. Um, the young lady next to me found the front of the beach incredibly depressing, <coughs> not so grumpy. Whereas, I, unfortunately, I saw resilience, which I thought was full of hopeful messages, although one of them was let's manage the inevitable. Mm -hmm. I do I would like to know whether that's how we view it in terms of the scientists. Let's manage the inevitable. Mm -hmm. I think we increasingly think about getting the right messages out that things are not inevitable. The, the future we have at the end of this century depends on whether we end up with a one and a half degree or a two degree or a three degree warmer than pre-industrial world. And we, we, we control that knob. Well, we, humankind controls that knob. Obviously, we've got to work through politicians for a lot of it. Um, so there's no inevitability. Um, think, things are not going to be wonderful, but the three degree world is one we don't want to live in. Yeah, I think absolutely. If there was any one message, it would be exactly that, which is that there's an enormous control we still have. I think we're inevitably facing quite large changes. But the, for example, with sea level rise, the difference between that sort of one and a half degree pathway and the high end, so sort of three or four degrees pathway by the end of the century is about twice, so it's about 40 centimetres of sea level rise, best guess, or about 80 centimetres. Um, so, and that's just, that is down to that policy, that, is that choice of policies. Uh, and it's a difference, one and a half degrees versus three or four degrees, which has obviously enormous effects on all sorts of other systems. And, and, I, and it's, <laughs> we're, we're at a critical juncture. I mean, it really does matter what happens in the next 10 years or 20 years. Uh, so, you know, yeah, we, I don't think anyone who's seriously thought about it is, is giving up. Uh, it's absolutely critical what is done. Uh, we can't avoid a lot of change, and it's already underway. But we can definitely affect, strongly affect the rate of change. And we can also, if we, we can stabilise systems in a changed state, but we can stabilise them. Uh, so if we follow that lower, lower trajectory, a lower emissions pathway, uh, things like snow cover and permafrost and sea ice and so on can stabilise at a, at a reduced size. And that has a, a, you know, a very important effect. And we can avoid some of those tipping points. Because uh, you know, there are lots of these tipping points which are looming close and we haven't necessarily crossed them. We can avoid them. And so it, it's, it's vital and it's critical to that, that uh, what we do in the next few years is, is absolutely critical. And, and really what, not really what we individually do, it's vital because we've all got to do what we possibly can. But it's what's done at the, at the top political level, at national level. It's funny that, so, you, 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 sorry, yeah. Amy, that you allude to the second player yeah. resilience and... Uh, towards the end of the play, I'm not going to, actually, I shouldn't give any of this away, but somebody says, and they're actually quoting an oceanographer called Charles Kennel, who came up with this, I think, very powerful phrase, although the character who says it is not necessarily somebody I'm in, <laughs> in agree with, with, but he says, to, to avoid the unmanageable and manage the unavoidable. Uh, and I think that's rather brilliant, that. Um, and, and I take some comfort from Hamish's sense that that might still be possible. But I think the how you set those <laughs> dials is the really difficult thing, isn't it? And to the degree to which you accept things that you basically write off, discount. You know, we just have to get used to this. It's a bit like Jeremy Hunt saying, you know, we'll have the full guarantee until April, then we'll review it. And essentially kind of casting people out into fuel poverty, you know, to calm the markets. And, you know, I think that sense of, well, you're just going to have to tough up, guys, is what I think that I want to explore in that play. You know, can democracy survive this experience? That's the other thing that really interests me, which I think resilience is about. Is democracy, is as it's currently constituted, fit for purpose for the climate crisis? You know, I think certain parts of the world are deciding not. You know, Brazil, to some extent, we'll see what happens over the next few months. Russia, obviously. You know, there are different, you know, this world is full of solutions that none of us want to see come to pass, which are, I think, neurotic responses to the climate crisis. 
Um, and, you know, we have to find a pathway which is not those solutions. That's the urgent political question, I think. Brilliant. One last question. Has anyone qu question from this section at all? Yeah. Yeah, when I first saw the play about 10 years ago, I was really impressed by the combination of um, the skill of the writing in drawing and a lot of very technical information about science that I've never seen discussed in that way on stage before. And kind of relating the local and local landscape of East Anglia, hardly ever written about, to a global story. And I was just wondering, you know, at that time, I couldn't think of anything else like it that was kind of, it was like an, made visible a space that I hadn't actually realised was there before. Do you feel now, Steve, like 10 years later, that there are more people exploring these kind of themes, dramatically, I mean, not just scientists, on the stage, in fiction, and in art? Definitely, 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 definitely. I mean, loads of people in loads of contexts, in loads of ways. And, I mean, I think, personally, the hope I take from this is that the crisis in the biosphere which I think is equally uh, urgent, um, obviously not unrelated to the climate crisis, is generating a whole new form of activism, looking back at Fiona again. I mean, in a way, the old <laughs> adage from environmentalism of, you know, think globally and act locally, uh, it's always been a very difficult thing to live by, and yet it has suddenly become, as never before, the, the key question. And it seems to me, I go back to your point about, you know, step one is what's going on around me? You know, air quality in Sheffield. Uh, in my case, I live at the south of the Fens. Personally, I think, you know, it's not a joke when at the end of the second, the first act of Resilience, Will says, rewild East Anglia. Uh, you know, honestly, it really should be allowed to return to its basic destiny as Fenland. And that, that actually, those kind of nature based solutions which, you know, trustonomics has you know, pulled the emergency cord on, but actually it's totally disgraced itself in the process. And I think this is quite an optimistic <coughs> time because the things which were just emergent and were becoming a little bit mainstream are really exciting about um, changes in landscape use and the way that can actually um, possibly also capture carbon. Um, and yeah, you can see that work in all sorts of ways, not just in art, but in, in the kind of fabric of politics, activism, uh, that definitely wasn't happening 10 years ago, I would argue. Um, and, and I think that the whole purpose of what we're trying to do with shows like this is to enlarge the imagination, enlarge the debate. As you say, make it very specific as well. Because I think a lot of the issues with these debates are they're very general and they're very abstract and art's very concrete. I think of Shakespeare's phrase, you know, the, the poet gives something, a local habitation and a name. He says in thesis, says I think in A Midsummer Night's Dream, a local habitation and a name. I actually think that's my job, is to kind of channel all this stuff into vivid people, vivid places, vivid stories. And I can see, you know, I'm not going to list all the people who are doing great work of that nature, but there's loads. Um, and the great thing about it is it's all great. <laughs> it's like, you know, the, you might have felt that you do this kind of work and then that's it. We've got that sorted. We've, we've done the story about climate change. But actually, of course, now what we need is much more granular stuff which is about the myriad of things that are contained within that phrase. Uh, and I think that's the future rather than big issue, big picture stuff. I think it is more and picking and picking this thing and showing us, putting a light on detailed stories. Mm. So I talk a bit too much there. I know you had your hand up for a while. Do you want to ask your question? Um, it was quite <coughs> similar, thank you. And it was really about the personal process of revising a play mm -hmm. really and the challenges and how that affected you? Well, it's a very strange thing. I don't generally go back to my work. I don't even read it. You know, I sort of think, well, that was then. Uh, I, I sort of fear to reread plays that I did several years ago. Um, so this was, but I've always thought this is more of a project than a play. Uh, you know, it's existed in lots of different forms. It's been a radio production. It was an unfilmed screenplay. Um, so I felt like it's been an open task for some time. Um, so it was a real thrill to return to it because, but I was also encountering a version of myself in the past and that's quite a strange thing. I mean, one of the lovely things about working with Chelsea and Caroline is, you know, they're asking questions about how I represent, you know, gender, how I represent, you know, contemporary behaviour, you know, you know, you have to really think about that because I'm a middle-aged white guy, you know, I'm sort of trying to tell this big story that will hopefully encompass a really big audience. And I've, you know, you've got to acknowledge all those massive social transformations over the last 
10 years that weren't necessarily reflected in the previous version. Uh, so I've, I've, I've loved that, actually. But it has been, you know, a, a learning curve. Um, and I think, you know, and, but there are signs of hope. Like Hamish mentioned the point about renewables. There's a speech in the original version where, you know, Chris Casson, the minister, berates the Pearl Sarika, uh, his private secretary, and say, you know, how much of, of, of energy is produced by renewables right now? And she can't even get to 5%. Mm. So that's 2009. That was, you know, that was true then. And, and this, the gap is really extraordinary, actually. And you can get used to that. <laughs> Whereas actually that is an amazing in sort of uh, indices of what can be achieved very, very quickly if we push in the same direction. Um, so that, that, those sort of moments were really wake up calls for me about my own potential cynicism, I suppose, you know, because it's very easy to be cynical about this. I'm not cynical about politics. I'm cynical about the current crop of politicians. It's always been a Tory government in my play. In resilience, and I, you know, if Keir Starmer got into power tomorrow, I'm not saying this would be heaven on earth, but it would, it would challenge this play. Um, and it doesn't mean that you know, two years on, I couldn't come up with a new version. But one certain things that had been normal for us for the last 12, 13 years would no longer be a reality for us in the same way. And I think that's, I hope that's the case, and I hope the play becomes out of date again. <laughs> On that note, please join me in giving these wonderful people a much And if you could also please extend our applause to the wonderful uh, team at the theatre today who have been helping put in this time of work. So thank you for your work. Also, as well, just a bit of a plug, there is this wonderful book that is on sale, which um, is, is basically the play in book form. But also, as well, if you are going to watch it, I highly recommend that you watch both of them and not just one of them, just so you can get the full picture. But yeah, thank you very much thank for joining us, guys. <laughs> <laughs>